On today's podcast, I will be speaking with Dr. Heather Williams. Dr. Williams has decades of experience responding to critical incidents and treating first responders who often witness firsthand things no person should ever have to. Hi, this is Joe Vargas from Behind the Badge, and today I'm here with Dr. Heather Williams. And today we'll be talking about a very important subject when it comes to first responders, um, something that's really made the front page of the news, and that's the issues related with uh, p- post-traumatic stress and uh, suicide within our first responder community. Um, it's not too long ago it was making nationwide headlines, uh, the number of officers, uh, let's say, in the city of Chicago that were committing suicide. And then when we looked across the spectrum of officers throughout the country, it wasn't just the city of Chicago. Uh, We've had some serious uh, mental health issues with first responders across the country. And uh, Dr. Williams, uh, you've got a lot of experience. I mean, we've gone back at least 10 years working together uh, in response to critical incidents and crisis involving uh, major crimes and trauma, not only with first responders, but with the community as well. A little bit of history here. I'll go back 10 years ago uh, that we had a particularly brutal uh, homicide in the city of Anaheim. An elderly woman had been um, beaten and sexually assaulted in a neighborhood that included a former police chief who lived in the neighborhood. And not only were the officers affected, but the entire community. And you and your team came out, and we walked the entire neighborhood through next healing steps with that one. And I want to say that was in 2010, and here we are now, and uh, your practice is booming. Sad to say, but I'm glad you're the one doing it. Thank you so much. Yeah. But uh, when you see all this going on, Heather, um, what do you think when you see that issues with uh, PTSD and suicide? I definitely see how the culture has shifted over the last five years, um, especially coming from a peer support standpoint as the regional peer support coordinator at the sheriff's department. And looking at that culture shift with the stigma of asking for help. In fact, I just spoke to somebody today about that very subject, that there's this perception, if I ask for help, I must be weak. And the stigma of asking for help, we've had to change that, and I have seen it change quite a bit, where more and more people are asking for help. But it's when things get really bad, when the anxiety level is through the roof and they're not functioning at home or they're not sleeping or they're drinking too much. And a a lot of that is they have to reach a certain threshold before they'll ask for help. Mm -hmm. And my goal is to try and help people feel strong in asking for help, seeing that asking for help is strength rather than weakness. Because if we can do it on the front end where, you know, I'm starting not to sleep well, I feel anxious at work, I had one panic attack, there's something going on, I should probably talk about it. That would be more ideal with the idea of trying to prevent the psychological injuries that cause post-traumatic stress. And I refer to it as an injury instead of a disorder for the sake of what we can now prove scientifically And a lot of the the psychological material that I share comes from a scientific standpoint because if you look at a brain scan with someone who has a post-traumatic stress injury, it actually shows up as hot spots, as a injury. And I'm trying to help people understand, like if you were on duty and you were in a foot pursuit and broke your foot, you'd be taken out of work, you'd go to the doctor, you'd rehab it, through, you know, probably physical therapy, you'd go back to work light duty and then full duty once you're cleared. Why can't we look at a brain injury or a psychological injury in that same fashion? And by doing so, even though you can't see it, we can still heal it and get you back to work. But because we're kind of, I feel like we're constantly trying to play catch up. So someone with 20, 30 years on who has a psychological injury for 20 to 30 years has developed this injury and now they're asking for help and there's a lot of stigma and guilt and embarrassment in that. And so my idea is let's try to prevent it from happening, you know, best case scenario. And then worst case scenario, let's take you out of work for a little bit of time. Let's work on getting you healed and there's a number of options for healing psychological injuries these days, which is pretty amazing. 
and then let's get you back to work light duty and then full duty. Let's try the same path that you would for a physical injury. What is it the general public doesn't realize about what officers and other first responders are experiencing? I mean, uh, I think oftentimes for the people that are out doing the job, they don't even realize they're getting hurt. That's a really good point. And I think it goes back to the human element in all of this. And this is what I teach at the basic academy. This is what I teach in my classes all over the state is the idea that it's okay to not be okay because before that gun and badge go on or firefighters, dispatchers, and we, you know, we can't forget our professional staff too, that you are a human being first and that trauma is something that happens to you. In fact, what I say is that trauma is something that happens to you. It is not something that you create. In fact, that is called drama. And there's a huge difference. And so by giving people permission to be human and say, hey, you can try your hardest to not let something bother you that you've seen, but you cannot unsee what you've seen. And some of the things they see are pretty dreadful that the average person will never see in their entire lifetime. Nor would we want them to. I mean, Absolutely. I go back, you know, in... You see, you go to traffic accidents, and it's not just people that have been killed, but severely injured. Uh, you go to family fights where there's intense emotional drama going on, and uh, alcohol is involved, and people are screaming and yelling, and you're the peacekeeper having to deal with this. And then you go back to your own family that night. Right. And, uh, and then there's the other things. You're dealing with some of the human element that most people will never, ever deal with. You know, the, the sociopaths, you know, people, career criminals, uh, child abusers. You're dealing with these day in and day out. And then um, simple things. I mean, it, somebody asked me the other day, how many dead bodies have you seen? I couldn't answer because I have the slightest idea. I know there were lots. And it wasn't just murder victims. It was suicides. It was uh, people who died of natural causes. But you're intimately involved with the emotions of the family members as they're experiencing them. That's, and I suppose this all takes a tremendous toll over time. That's a really important point. Um, I have a lot of first responders who come see me in private practice. In fact, my entire private practice is based on public safety and their families. And they will say things to me like, well, it's not the dead bodies that bother me. And I'm saying, I know. It's the reactions of the living that get to us the most. In my previous life, being a program director for CSP Victim Assistance Programs and a crisis response, responder, um, that's what I got called to, to manage the emotional trauma that the family members, the next of kin, the victims were experiencing so that law enforcement could focus on the investigation and policy and procedure and doing what you guys do. And dealing with someone who is in absolute crisis, wailing in distress, possibly becoming violent as a result of the crisis reactions, and trying to navigate officer safety and investigations and everything that you guys do, those living reactions are the hardest to get out of the head. And I tell people, listening to a human be being wail in distress is almost soul penetrating. Like I could feel it in my bones when I was on scene listening to a woman wail in distress. And it can create a lot of helplessness for the first responder who's there to help. You can't make their pain stop. And so yes, first responders take that home with them. They take that with them, you know, on their uniform and in their ears. And you, you can't unhear what you've heard just like you can't unsee what you've seen. The brain still has to process that. And I think that over the course of the generations and the time that I've been in this business that I've seen more and more people start to talk about, yeah, that was bad or that rocked me or I know I can't ever unsee it, but being able to process it and talk about it openly and honestly with someone you can trust to me is, is huge. And there's, and oftentimes I see first responders taking negative ways of dealing with with some of the stress that they're under. Absolutely. And that includes uh, drinking, mm -hmm. you know, and other behaviors that are self-destructive, really. And uh, in the old days, and my father was a cop in the 60s, it was pretty much, you know, suck it up, you know, son, uh, come down to the bar, have a drink. Right. And that was the way you dealt with critical incidents. And probably beginning in the late 80s, early 90s, we saw 
more attention given to how we process them. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm proud to say that in most areas and most departments, we're seeing a lot more attention given to the psychological and mental health of the people working for these agencies. Absolutely. Um, I can speak across Orange County. There's definitely a lot more buy-in, and the buy-in has to be at the top. The chiefs and the command staff have to say, yes, this is an important part of policing, and it's taking care of our own. And that's where peer support programs and relationships with mental health professionals play a role. And I, how I like to say it is that it takes a village to do this work. And so you've got everybody from the dispatcher taking the calls to the officers and, and sergeants out in the field to the investigators and the crime lab and all these different populations of people within a criminal justice system, let alone law enforcement. And we have to have each other's back the way that you would have your back out in the field. Why aren't we looking out for each other and their mental health? And without the support from the top, it makes it harder to create a culture within a law enforcement or fire agency to do that. Let's talk a little bit about dispatchers, because like you said earlier, oftentimes they're forgotten. But Absolutely. Extremely stressful job. It's like you're constantly playing the telephone game where you don't have direct eye contact and there's no body language involved. It's strictly voice. You know, voice. Mm -hmm. And when people call oftentimes at 911, there's a tremendous amount of desperation when they're calling. And uh, how... Uh, uh, are you seeing a lot more dispatchers seeking help? I would say over the course of the last 10 years, I have seen dispatchers start to feel that they're being thought of now. And as dispatchers have told me for years, Heather, we're the last to be remembered and the first to be forgotten. In fact, they are the lifeline to the person making that call and the officers out in the field going to that call. And they play such a very important role. And I don't know that they've been given that level of respect and attention over the over many, many years. But yes, they are absolutely struggling with very similar issues and feelings of helplessness and not having all the all the parts, right? They they take the call, they triage it, officers get on scene, and now they're off to take the next call. So they don't get closure. And one of the things that um, actually La Habra Police did after their last officer-involved shooting was they took the dispatchers out to the scene to show them where everything happened, to be able to put a visual and, and create some closure on what exactly they were hearing in the background because it went on for quite a long time. And that helped them tremendously. And so I use that as a teaching tool when I'm out teaching law enforcement agencies, like, hey, if you can... Take your dispatchers out. Let them see where this took place. Because all they're hearing, they're creating visuals in their own head. There's this whole perception that, uh, and we've talked a little bit about this, about seeking help is a sign of weakness. And in an industry that's um, very much dominated by type A personalities who focus a lot on being strong uh, to seek help, might be seen as, oh my gosh, this guy can't cut it, or this gal can't cut it for this job. But in reality, this is true for all human beings, isn't it? Absolutely. I think that's where the human element is, is that you, no matter what shirt you put on, uniform, gun, badge, you're still a human being walking out into the field. And to not give people permission to do that um, is, as we can see, a negative for their for their mindset and their coping. But I also think what's really important is that we create a culture. And sometimes I, 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 when I teach, I say, yeah, you may have to suck it up. You're on scene. You're an officer. You have to focus on what you're doing, make sure everybody's safe, and do, do what you've signed up to do. But the difference is when you're done on that call or you're safe inside your vehicle or back at the station or changing into your, you know, your civilian clothing that you give yourself permission, that it's not weakness to feel. It's not weakness to experience reactions. In fact, I jokingly say, but kind of seriously say, that feelings is the F word of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. oh, I can see that. <laughs> right? And so, it, okay, so you don't want to feel, then react. Mm -hmm. Let's change the way we speak about it 
you don't want to go to talk to mental health professional to talk about your feelings, then let's go and process and debrief your reactions at the scene or at the situation. There's just so much that's going on in, in the field of law enforcement. And it's obviously there's these high expectations from the public that you be perfect in your response, you be perfect in your investigations. And it's just what we said, we've hired human beings and we expect human feelings. Uh, how much do you feel the negative sentiment towards law enforcement has actually increased the level of stress within the profession? I'd say over the last decade, I've, I've definitely had those conversations with public safety, uh, law enforcement in particular, that it's an added layer of stress. It's not only an added layer of stress, it sometimes provokes anxiety in making decisions. And in a field where you have to sometimes make those split-second decisions, that can interfere with their sense of uh, confidence that not only will they do the right thing because their training and experience tells them what to do, but in the aftermath, will they get the same level of support that they need but from their departments? And sometimes it's, it's not the shooting, it's not the use of force, it's what happens in the aftermath and the perception of support by the organization or by the command staff. And there's often said that, you know, the, uh, I remember a lot of officers saying the internal stress was far worse than anything they experienced in the field. Yep. Give me a homicide any day rather than have to deal with the organizational stress on the inside. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. is something that's evident across the whole profession, that there is stress because we are a profession that deals with very stressful incidents day in and day out, and it gets internalized a lot, and there's a high expectation from the communities about what we should be doing, how we should be doing it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I guess a, a course of treatment would be to stop watching the news. <laughs> <laughs> or at least question what you're watching. Mm-hmm. And that's something I've done, I think, my entire life, just even before law enforcement experience, mm-hmm. is that's, that's their perception. They're reporting it based on how they're seeing it or based on what the PIO is giving. But... It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to to invest a little time or energy and to know that what you're seeing is someone else's reality. It might not be the reality of what that person actually went through. So often the public, they see the person with the badge and the gun and the uniform and, and the police car. And what they never see is the husband, the soccer coach, the father. You know, They just don't see that this person who is coming there is a human being and has a life just very much like their own. Right. But the unrealistic expectations they put on them is actually helping to contribute to a lot of the basically, uh, you know, this epidemic, what we call uh, illness that is spreading throughout the, the, the industry or injury, as you have said. Yes. I think it goes back to something very simple, is that as human beings in their communities, that I, it takes a village to, to do this work, and it also takes part of that village is the community. And the community trusting their law enforcement officers, not believing everything they see on TV, not thinking that every TV show they watch is the way it is, everything from the law and orders to the CSIs and all the law enforcement shows on TV, um, those are fake. Those, those are Hollywood. And I remember sitting watching some of these shows and saying, that's not how it is as a victim advocate, as a program director. Um, I feel like the media is trying to do a better job in some ways with you know, live PD and the, the A&E shows at least showing you know, the ride-alongs and, and the reality of policing. Um, but it goes back to, in my opinion, believing that this person's a human being and to give them some grace and trust them to that they're doing the right thing before they're doing the wrong thing. Let's, let's walk through a scenario here. Um, a team of officers has responded and uh, they're dealing with an incident that's probably one of the worst ones you'll ever deal with, a child death or a child homicide. And uh, there's a lot of drama, there's a lot going on. And uh, now you have a whole team of people, everybody from the police officers to the forensics people to the dispatchers. How do you go about treating an entire team like that? What would, how would you respond to that? So I'll, I'll come at it from a peer support standpoint and then kind of branch that out. 
And how I would teach a peer support team is that you, you've now had a major critical incident involving a child. Um, there's no second guessing or questioning whether that's going to be impactful. Anytime a child is killed, it's very traumatic and upsetting for everybody involved. And so what I would ask is for people on the peer support team to reach out to their dispatchers, their officers who are involved, their CSI um, sergeants, whoever's on scene, whoever's taking the calls and processing this incident to be reached out to. Hey, we just heard about the homicide, wanted to check in on you. Do you have a few minutes to talk? Of course, not in the middle of while they're actually responding to it, but maybe shortly after. And kind of getting a, a temperature, uh, for lack of a better term, of how are people reacting to this? And then after a couple days, two, three days at least is my, my opinion, because it takes about 72 hours to process something stressful and, and critical like that. Then within a week to bring them all back together into a room and, and facilitate a critical incident debriefing. And that way you get everybody in there. And the way that I facilitate these and believe have been helpful based on feedback is to ask everybody what their role was. Because by asking them what their role was, they're able to put the pieces of the puzzle back together. And I always start with dispatch. They're the ones typically who get the call first. Mm -hmm. What do the reporting parties say? What did that sound like or look like? And what comes out of what was your role are a lot of details that are missing for everybody else involved. It helps to put those pieces back together. And then it also gives them an avenue to start talking about the thoughts and reactions that they had to the event, unprovoked, without asking, and how did that make you feel? Because I won't ask that. And once that's done and we then start talking about the second question, which is what stands out for you, that's an opportunity for people to start processing what it is that might still be stuck in the brain. That scene, that screaming, that whatever it was. And it helps provoke some healing and closure. And the reason I, I bring up my two-step model is because I actually wrote my dissertation on critical incident debriefing and building resiliency in law enforcement and did research on my two-step model. And the irony is that I went to a law enforcement agency in Orange County. I was called to do a debrief many, many years ago. I think it was in 2010. And they said, Heather, you have an hour. That's all we can give you is an hour. And the two models I had been taught in said, it's going to take anywhere from two to three hours. And I'm like, okay, I better figure this out really quick. And so those two questions were the questions I utilized. And in that hour, I, were, I was able to facilitate it. And so I used that as kind of a foundation for the last 10 years and did my research on it. And it came back with some really good outcomes. And once those debriefs are done, with peer support in the room, um, th this is where we bring the village back. We have a chaplain. We have, you know, the department has a trauma dog. Um, and the facilitator, and with peer support, we can identify where maybe some people a week later are still struggling quite a bit. And because acute stress reactions can last anywhere from three to about 30 days, I usually make that the benchmark. Like, hey, give it a few more weeks, see how you're doing, and I give them a handout on the normal stress reactions. So they actually can have something physically to look at and looking at the symptoms that they may be experiencing. I do that to normalize things and to validate what they're going through as normal so they don't think that they're crazy. And I've had a lot of people say that to me. Heather, I thought I was going crazy. You can't go crazy if you're having normal reactions. So again, reducing stigma, getting people to start talking. And within that time frame, if peer supporters or chaplain or somebody in the department is like, you know what, he's still struggling then the next step after the debrief is to get them into the one-on-one -on -one counseling with a mental health professional because they may need a little more processing. And the idea behind talking and debriefing about the incident and to experience that vulnerability in a safe place is to help process that and heal from it, to reduce the likelihood of a post-traumatic stress injury later on. It doesn't mean you're going to forget it. Like, you know, there's a bunch of incidents you've been on in your career where you're not, you're never going to forget what happened, but you're able to process it and not have that emotional tie that's so overwhelming and devastating that every time someone talks about it, they start crying. 
Yeah, I, I think for myself and for many others, I, the, the, what we try not to do is park there. Right. You know, we try not to stay there. We try to move on and other things happen. Um, that's the critical incident, but oftentimes it's not just one incident, but it's accumulation of what we would call, I guess, trauma. Absolutely. Just bits and pieces, time after time after time after time, and they just sort of pile on with each other. But uh, what are some of the steps that you recommend when you're speaking to first responders about how do you remain healthy? What is it they can do in order to, you know, facilitate uh, healing? You know, even from the little stuff. I mean, I can remember going to family fight calls where I just walk out just emotionally drained from trying to keep the peace. Oh, absolutely. Um, I do want to make one mention here that what you just referred to as the accumulation of trauma, there's actually a term now called police complex spiral trauma. Okay. Right. I'll try to remember that. Police <laughs> spiral complex. Police complex viral trauma. And um, I found that doing research for my dissertation. I've actually connected with this psychologist who, who formulated that idea. And um, he's spot on. It's the accumulation of trauma over time, tension, and frequency of exposure to traumas. Small traumas, big traumas, far apart, close together. It could be one big one, like a mass casualty incident that sends people over the edge. And so I feel like the first part of, of recognizing the trauma that hits us is, is really an acknowledgement. It's to say, I feel you, I see you, I hear you, I'm experiencing you, because what I've learned from working in this business for as long as I have is that the more you push or shove or avoid trauma, the harder it pushes and shoves back, and it wants to be dealt with. And so if we could just give ourselves permission to say, that sucked, I hope I never have to see that again, knowing full well you probably will, but that you can actually vocalize it and that you can talk about it and then say, okay, I acknowledge that that kicked my butt. I need to do something about it that is proactive so that it doesn't get stuck in there. I'm going to reach out to someone on peer support. I'm going to reach out to a mental health professional, a, um, a religious spiritual leader. Whatever makes them feel good and happy about that, but also then start engaging in some self-care like, I'm going to go for a run. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to, I make jokes about, I don't care what you do, as long as it's going to be good for your body. A dance class, a... Yoga, you know, a lot of people are turning to yoga and stretching to help with self care and the mind body connection and healing. Um, hobbies, interests, uh, time in in the in nature, going camping, fishing, hiking. People have so many different things that they do, and what I have found in this business, because of burnout and because of the sheer number of hours and the overtime, that people will say things like, "I used to." I used to golf, I used to swim, I used to work out. And it's like, all right, time out. Because the only control that you have over anything right now is over you and your choices, your reactions, your behavior. What can you do to feel better about just your existence right now? And it's not just the individual themselves in fact, impacted, but uh, it's also their coworkers, their family members, their spouses, their children. Absolutely, that, that are, huge ripple. That are going to be bearing the brunt of this as well. I mean, I don't know if the statistics still are, are up there for divorce within the profession of policing. It's still higher than it is for the general population. I've heard as high anecdotally as 75% for the first marriage. And in the general population, it goes to 85%, which would be equivalent to what law enforcement professionals deal with, too. Mm. And, you know, just the strain, uh, it becomes difficult for intimacy, I think, a lot of times for people who are first responders, because you're so good at compartmentalizing your emotions after a while, or you're a rock, you're stoic, and they just build up over time. Absolutely. Um, I have quite a few couples, law enforcement couples, fire couples that are coming to me, and they have unique stressors because of the work, because of the shift work, the hours, the days, the holidays, um, just cultural elements of officer safety and hypervigilance, where they'll go on vacation, where they sit in a restaurant. Like, There's so many different factors that play into this, and I, I'm not speaking from 
this doesn't come out of a book somewhere. I'm living this life too. I'm in a law enforcement relationship. And we have had to learn to navigate life on a different plane because it's, it's just different. But without communication, without learning how to communicate, which when I teach, I talk about how, you know, nobody's really taken a class on how to be in a healthy relationship. They don't exist in our curriculum, at least here in California. And we go based on what we've learned growing up, whether it's from the media or it's from the movies or it's from our own homes. And so we've learned some bad habits. We've learned some amazing habits. And it's learning how to talk about it openly and get the support so that when you do go home and you have you've think you've compartmentalized, but you realize that your behavior is changing at home, that you're short-fused, that your kids, you know, you're impatient with your kids, you've kicked the dog, and now you're, you're yelling at your wife because she made the wrong dinner or whatever it may be. Those, those to me are the symptoms of either burnout or trauma. It's like you have to kind of dig a little, like where is this coming from? Just because the dishes aren't done doesn't mean that this relationship's over. Let's go on to a little bit, you know, I think we tend to avoid it a lot, but it's really the dark side and something we're only beginning to dwell with in officer suicides. Uh, what are some of the numbers we're looking at? Because up until just recently, nobody really tracked the number of first responders, police officers, firefighters that were taking their own lives. Right. Um, I'm not sure if bluehelp.org has been doing this for many, many years. I know they have for the last, um, I want to say, three or four years. And going from a number of 228 last year to this year already, we're at 36 law enforcement suicides. And bluehelp.org is saying that out of those 36, six were retired law enforcement. I still don't believe that's a completely accurate number. And the reason I say that is there's still many departments not reporting it. And I also had a conversation with some federal law enforcement who said that they had two in one month and they don't document it. So this doesn't include the federal law enforcement officers that are also dying by suicide. And I, I almost feel like it's gone. We know what the number is now and it's getting more attention because of the media attention attached to it as well. We really don't know how sick we are then. We don't. Yeah. And um, I mean, in my own career, I can think of at least three officers that took their own lives. And that was just with one department. Wow. And uh, you look back at the, the police departments and there's over a million police officers yep. in the United States today. Uh, we all strive to have healthy organizations within police departments. You know, we look at what's going on and we try to pour in, and it does take resources to get this done. Absolutely. And, but it, uh, you mentioned earlier, it takes intentionality, you know, a desire to want to go out. And uh, you work a lot with individual officers as, uh, for peer support, fellow officers who take it upon themselves as a collateral duty, often with no extra pay, to help each other out. Yes, absolutely. How does the peer support network work within an agency? Well, peer supporters within an agency, um, it's just what you said, they, their heart's in the right place. They have been through their own trials and tribulations, their own adversities and traumas, many of them, and they want to pay it forward. And being on peer support is an opportunity to pay forward and to grow from their traumatic experience. It's called post-traumatic growth. And having sat in on most department interviews and selection pr procedures, um, that's what I hear a lot of, is I went through this within the organization, or I lost a child, a stillbirth, or I, I mean, you think about all the things that people deal with. They now have an opportunity to take their healing to another level and help others. And so that's been one of the most amazing opportunities I've had is being able to help establish these peer support programs and see people grow from their own adversities. What would you tell the members of the public about what they should know about police officers today? Because we try to direct a lot of what we do here behind the badge, not just to those within the profession, but the general public. The first word that popped into my mind when you asked me that question was respect. And it goes back to having mutual respect for human beings. 
regardless of your experience maybe in the past, if you maybe have had bad experiences with police officers, is respect their authority, respect their position, and give them some grace and understand that they're coming from a place of officer safety. They want to go home to their families every night. And sometimes they come off a little gruff because of it. But when you're respectful, they're going to meet you there because they truly want to help their communities. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there to begin with Mm -hmm. on one hand or the other. When the 911 call comes in, everybody goes. Yep. No questions asked. They will be there. And they don't know who they're going to or what they've been through. The same as you don't know, being a community member, what they have been through. And many law enforcement have been through a lot, even within a childhood, you know, bad childhood experiences that made them want to protect their communities to pay that forward too. And so maybe don't make assumptions, give them some grace and be respectful. I think it all comes down to just get to know them. Yeah, they're human beings. Well, not only they're human beings, I mean... In my experience, they're extraordinary human beings. Oh, without a doubt. You know, not only because they do their job, but even in their private lives, they're doing amazing things. They're coaches, like I've said before. They're scout leaders. They're leaders in their communities, at their churches, their schools. And uh, everybody wants the cop to live next door to them. That's very true. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Heather, thank you very much for your time and effort. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, and we look forward to speaking to you again sometime in the future. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and it's truly my honor to serve and protect those who serve and protect us. Thank you, Heather.